Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Trader Merlin Show for your Hump Day Wednesday. I didn't put the date down on my thing. It is the, what's the 6th of March today. I should have the same graphic up I had up for yesterday, which is that roller coaster ride of people screaming with their hands up in the air. Now, all of a sudden, ripping back to the upside. Nice uh, 7.5% gain for Bitcoin today. Wildness. But I'm not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about a question that was brought in from one of the viewers. And I thought, you know what? I don't think I've ever talked about this, which is kind of surprising given all the different topics out there in the financial markets. And that topic is Basel III. Uh, what is Basel III to be precise? And of course, with my nice little AI graphic here, you have you know a financial institution on the right with the big old Superman, the hero above it. Well, we'll see if this is really the intended objective. So this was created from Scott, who sent this on this morning. My guess is you're probably watching the... Um, the testimony with your own pal. He says, I'm Roland. I read an article today which talked about Basel III and how it will hurt banks. Can you please explain it? So I guess before we dive into the mechanics of it all and what it means to you, some of you are probably going to tune out already because you're like, I just don't care about Basel. Well, well, you should because it's going to create some opportunities for us. And there could be some good long-term opportunities here with regards to Basel and its implementation, which should happen July of next year. So first off, what is it? When we go back to our financial crisis of 2007 and 2008, one of the big reasons we saw Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns have such issues is lack of oversight, bad investments, bad operational procedures, over leveraging, right? Just doing things that were outside the scope of what those businesses should have been focusing on. Maybe not necessarily outside the scope, but at least pushing the boundaries of what they were doing. And Basel proposes an international set of standards that proposes here's a set of rules that banks should follow so that we don't put ourselves in a situation that we have that same sort of financial crisis of 2007 and 8. Now granted we had one last year. I'm like, "Oh, well that one was pretty bad." That was a different one. That was slightly different um with at least with the mechanics pieces that have driven it. Now, this Basel 3 of course comes on the heels of Basel 2, which came on the heels of Basel 1. This one they call Basel 3 Endgame. Now, let me just go to some graphics that I prepared for you this afternoon on this one. Which is, um, did I put these in order? One second, make sure I have them all in order here because I, I, I did spend some time building this out for you guys. Um, before I do that, let's, let's talk about how banks make money. And I think everybody here knows, oh good, never heard about it, never heard about it. I love it. I love the fact you guys have not um, heard about it because this is huge. It basically is this giant regulatory umbrella that's going to be forced upon our banking system. On one hand, it could be really good. On the other hand, it could be disastrous depending on how you look at it. And I'll try to do this objectively, pointing at both sides, the pros and cons to each one. So let's first off, to understand this, we gotta understand how banks make money. And keep in mind, when we think banks, you're thinking, you know, Huntington Bank shares, Goldman Sachs, um, Fidelity, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, the list goes on and on and on. Every single one of those has an objective and that objective is not that you are a happy customer that objective is not that you have a checking or savings account the objective is that shareholders make money that the company makes money period so they are kind of on the hook now to have continually growing earnings and revenue and all those metrics need to be going up and up and up and up and up so there comes a point where a business will push the boundaries of current regulatory environment to make more profit, to make more earnings. Maybe they buy more speculative investments. They invest in, instead of treasuries, they buy junk bonds to get that extra yield. Instead of um, doing all the due diligence with regards to a mortgage issuance, they just go, hey, can you fog a mirror? Okay, fine, good, you're good. Well, we'll loan you a half a million dollars, right? That's what happened in 2005, six, seven, and eight. So businesses will, will push the envelope at all times. Now, what's interesting is, is kind of how these banks make money. So I thought, let's let's start their groundwork and work our way up. So how do banks make money? Number one, mortgages, right? Basically, for especially for commercial banks, when we deposit money, that money now gets lent out. Right now, you can go to Chase. They will pay you 0.01% interest for, a, um, for savings deposits, 0.01%. What they'll do is they'll now lend that out and mortgage rates right now are you know six to seven percent so they're making almost seven percent for free off our money that's one way next piece is auto loans right so you might go to your wells fargo and say hey i'd like a new car loan or a used car loan same thing they're bar they're taking our deposits and lending those out and earning a much higher rate of return who knows your auto loan maybe six seven eight percent depending on your credit could be much higher 
Um, they also do business loans. So anybody here who runs a small business, you you may have a loan with your bank, and that's part of where my deposits have gone. Right? I keep money in my Chase account. I know I shouldn't. I keep some there just as an emergency fund because it's so easy to, to do checks and all that type of stuff and have a bank. Oh, yeah, Liz, Chase is really generous. It's not just Chase. It's Bank of America, Wells Fargo. Any of the real big um, commercial banks are charging almost nothing are giving you almost nothing, excuse me. If you go to something like an Ally or SoFi, they don't have the overhead of physical buildings or ATM machines or employees because it's mainly online. Therefore, they'll pay you a lot more. You can get three and a half, four percent um, 4% going to some of these online banks, which is a different ball game. But still, like SoFi, for example, is doing these type of lending procedures to earn an extra rate of return on their money. So I'm running through just some of the basic stuff. You guys all know this at this point. Uh, personal loans as well. Maybe you want to get a, a home equity line of credit. You want to, you know, get some debt consolidation loan, whatever. That's also available at banks. Of course, you're going to be paying seven, eight, nine percent for those. With the bigger firms like your Goldman Sachs, your JP Morgans, of course, they have extensive trading departments as well. When they start to cross that line between a commercial bank and a kind of an investment bank, you know, that, that is a little bit of a gray area and blurs it a bit. Here you run into something a little bit different. So when you looked at mortgages, auto loans, business loans, personal loans, that's fairly fairly caged, if you will, meaning it's kind of a one-dimensional thing. You're just lending money out. So really the risk to that bank is the credit worthiness of the individual that they're making that loan to. When we look at a business or a bank, a financial institution that has a trading desk, now we are taking on a whole new set of risk. And, and that might be in the umbrella of what's called operational risk, right? From their business operations, where is some of the weaknesses? And we've seen rogue traders or what's called fat fingers or just trading mistakes made. Maybe they all go all in on, on a canoe or go EV that has just gone straight down and lose all their money. Those are operational risks. But, you know, what are the rules around that? What's the framework around these financial institutions with regards to what they can be doing with trading? Again, that's how they make money. A lot of money, like Goldman Sachs, huge money off their trading department. And I also put in here investment banking. This is underwriting new companies, right? bringing companies public. That's a huge money maker for companies like Goldman Sachs and BlackRock. And then finally, fees. So I, I wanted to just kind of put that up front so we all kind of say, OK, here's how these firms make money. And you're probably wondering, well, why did I start there? Why that foundational overview? You're like, Merlin, you're talking to us like we're four-year-olds. No, it's to set the context because Basil is going to come in and say every single piece of this list here, plus much, much more that I didn't have time to list, Basil is going to have their hands in how mortgages are done, auto loans, business loans, personal loans, trading, investment fee, all that is going to be impacted by Basil. So let's go back and explain a little bit about um, with those lists of things that we have, what are the, the main risks to a bank? And I, I kind of wrote it, broke it down into four main categories that I could think of, at least from my experience. And number one on that list is going to be credit risk. Now, the credit risk is the credit risk for all those loans they, they give out. You know, I look at, um, all right, I'll, it sounds cocky and arrogant, but if I look at my credit rating, I have a very good credit rating. I'm well over 800. I have, I'm, I'm financially okay. I really don't represent any credit risk to a, a, a bank if I was to take out a loan for pretty much anything. However, I'm sure you all know somebody who can, who's living paycheck to paycheck and maybe they're fudging the numbers a little bit so they can get a new car loan or get a mortgage and you realize they shouldn't have that, right? That's a much bigger credit risk to these institutions. Now, under the current rules, it's kind of a blanket assessment of risk for banks. One of the things Basel is going to do is going to take credit risk to a whole other level and each individual mortgage will have to have its own assessed credit risk based off of the loan to value, right? What is the risk to the bank for that mortgage? This changes the dynamics of these banks a little bit. John, you don't have a credit score. You do. It's, it might be zero, but you should have a credit score. Everyone should have a credit score. If you don't have one, open up a credit card today. Use your credit card for everything paid in full. Build your credit. Credit's really important. Um, Richard Kiyosaki, who is rich dad, poor dad, he laughs all the time at Dave Ramsey because Kiyosaki, uh, Dave Ramsey says you should never have any debt. Kiyosaki says, I'm a billionaire because I have debt. He goes, I couldn't be a billionaire without my debt. It's taking borrowing money at, let's say, 5% and earning 10% on it. Well, now I'm getting 5% 
on my capital that I borrowed from somebody else. I didn't even have to have it. I borrowed it. So leverage. Um, John, if you if you can borrow money at 2.5% and buy yourself a, a home that's going to appreciate at a historical value of around eight, 6 to 8%, then you have basically free cash flow, free positive income from that. You're earning. It's it's called uh, good debt. Credit score is if you ever need money, if you ever want to buy a car or get anything like that, first thing they're going to look at is a credit score. Unless you're going to pay cash for everything, which I think could be a good thing to pay cash for most. However, when we have money that's been as cheap as it was these past couple of years, you know, getting down to 2.5% for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage is ridiculously cheap, right? You could now take that mortgage... Get a, get a $500,000 loan, deposit it in a CD um, at SoFi and get 4.5% and make 2% for free. You should all have a credit score. It'll help you pay your revolving debt before it's due. Yeah, Sly, the only um, term debt, like mortgages, car payments, you know, those are make the minimum payments and, and keep that as long as the rate is low enough. But any credit card should be paid in full without question. Every credit card should be paid in full. Yes, so Big Eb says Basel III is an international banking initiative. Correct, it is a um, international banking thing. I'll get to that here in just a second, okay? Not everyone can be that guy. Everyone can be a millionaire using Dave Ramsey's baby steps. I, it'll take longer. I think once, if see, if you take Dave Ramsey's approach and you say, I'm gonna clear myself of all my debt, what you've done right there is shown that you have fiscal response or financial responsibility. Once you understand debt, good debt versus bad debt. And you don't take on any bad debt, but you focus on good debt and say, how can I leverage this to make my life better? Then you'll get to that road to being a millionaire much faster than Dave Ramsey ever could using Kiyosaki's attitude of debt. But anyway, let me get back to banks. So first one's credit risk. Second one's market risk, right? This is investments that the bank may have. And you guys can think of this right now from what happened to Silicon Valley Bank and from Signature Bank. Remember, Signature Bank went under and Silicon Valley Bank went under because of market risks, right? What happened to those two? They were borrowing short-term and buying long-term bonds. So they were borrowing and paying their customers, you know, let's say 0.2%. And then they were buying long-term dated 10-year bonds that were making 25 to 3%. So for them, they're making 3% for free. Boom, easy. I don't have to do anything. I take your deposits. I make 3% on that cash free amazing and we're not talking like thousands of dollars we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars so it's huge business however when that yield curve flipped and all of a sudden they started losing money on those bonds or breaking even those bonds the formula didn't look so good then a small run on the bank forced them to sell those long-term bonds and all of a sudden they took massive losses if they held those bonds to maturity everything would have been fine but they couldn't because customers needed money that's a market risk Right? This could be a black swan event like we saw in uh, March, April, and May of 2020. Right, Those things could happen very, very quickly. So that's your second element of risk to a bank. Third component is operational risk. This is, again, that rogue trader. This is buying bad, bad systems and accounting issues. That is, you're running your business poorly and you made mistakes. This happens all the time as well as we saw with that New York commercial bank recently. We looked at that one yesterday. And then the last one's going to be liquidity. So Signature Valley, uh, sorry, Signature Valley, Silicon Valley, Signature, uh, First Republic all had a liquidity issue, meaning that when customers wanted their deposits, there wasn't enough money there because they lent it out to all those mechanisms for banks to earn money. So these are the four main risks to bank, credit risk, market risk, operational risk, and liquidity risk. What Basil says is, let's look at those and tighten up those standards a bit. Herein lies the problem, because if you tighten up those standards, then all of a sudden you start to have some issues with how banks are making and the quantity of money that they can make. So what is Basel? As Big Eb said, it's an international, basically, agreement. It's a set of reforms, reform measures intended to improve regulation, supervision, and risk management in the international banking sector. So it's not something that's unique to the United States. This is an international matter which I think is a very good thing, right? Let's get some global level of standardization so we don't get you know, European bank failures, US bank failures, Jap Japanese bank failures. We don't wanna see the bank failures. Obviously, the sign of a strong economy is going to be having stable financial systems in place and Basel intends to secure those. So, what does Basel intend to do? Well, first off, 
it's almost preferential treatment. So Basel III is going to go after all the banks with a hundred billion dollars of assets under management of assets, right? Now I've real quickly just kind of gone under, gone quickly and looked at Finviz here to find a screener. Said, okay, who's got the market capitalization? Which isn't exactly the measure of it, right? But you can kind of get an idea here. Citigroup. Wells Fargo, Bank of, Mor uh, Bank of America, JP Morgan, you have Bank of Montreal, a bunch of other banks here. And this is just based off market cap, not assets. I understand that there's gonna be a, a bigger audience here with regards to assets under management. But just to give you an idea that these are some of the players that will be hit. It's the big ones, the big banks. So as I have up here written, it's going after the banks with 100 billion in assets or more. So when we run through these rules real quick, just know that there is going to be a specific group that's going to get hit by this. Yep, Basel III, and, and just so you know, the Basel III proposal has been going, it's been around a while, and they were supposed to end, I believe November of 2023 was the final day to put in comments from banks, and banks are going, whoa, 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 hold on, we want an extension on that. We want an extension on that because we don't, this is coming at us too quickly. Banks are fighting this. Right? The big banks are going to fight this. J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citigroup are all going to fight this tooth and nail because what it means is way more oversight, way more control, and they're going to have to put up a lot more money to fund their current operations, which in theory, at least from my perspective, should hit their bottom line earnings, meaning numbers are going to decline. Right? All said in a nutshell, you're probably going to see some struggles for J.P. Morgan and these firms going forward. Now, hold on a second. Don't rush out there and, you know, try to get in the after hours, start shorting these stocks. This isn't going to happen right now. Let me finish and I'll tell you the timeline here. So, yeah, World Economic Forum. Yep. Uh, is Basel III an acronym for something? Um, yeah, I think it is. I can't remember. I can't remember what the acronym for Basel is. Um, banking. I, yeah, I don't remember what it is. You got me on that one. So as I got here, its implementation is slated for July of 2025. So again, we don't need to worry about this at any point from, for a while. Just know that these, these reforms, I, I believe, are going to come regardless, but they may change. So this could be pretty... Andre says, does Basel III promote shadow banking? Yeah. Let me get to the disadvantages here in a second. And yes, um, I, I think it really... One second here... I think it really does promote shadow banking. Shadow banking is, you know, going into areas of the markets that are unregulated by these financial standards. And yeah, you know, it's it's like going if you're going to get a loan and you can't get approved from your normal bank, what are you going to do? You're going to go to hard money, which are outside some of the regulatory constraints and and that generally is problematic. So yes, it will promote shadow banking absolutely, Andreas. Yeah. Um I think Bigup says Basel one was capital requirements. Basel two is review and oversight. Basel three is implementation. Yeah, and and really standardizing what exactly those measurements are. So I I'm not going to include in here all of the metrics of what the, the the requirements are, but basically it's this: increased capital requirements pretty much across the board. From the numbers I've been looking at, they're saying it's about 170 to 200 billion dollars worth of capital that these banks will have to put in to come up to meet those requirements. So. In my mind, what I'm thinking is if I'm JP Morgan, and these are not actual numbers, I'm just coming up with a, a simple hypothesis for you. If I'm JP Morgan, and let's say once this Basel III is implemented, I look at all of my valuations and I have to run through my mortgages, my trading operations, my operation, all those risk metrics have a specific calculator that is now being mandated by Basel. And it will probably show that I need to put in more money into my company as reserves to fill those requirements. So I have to, let, let's say I have to put in a billion dollars. I have two choices. I can either get a billion dollars and push it into the company so I can keep all of those existing pieces in place, all those mortgages, all those trading operations, all my operational risk, all that stuff stays in place. Or I can now cut back on things to drop down as a, so I'm not putting in more money, but cutting my exposure so that I have less exposure. What that means is lower earnings for these banks. So either they put in more money and stay where they're at earnings wise, which in my mind reduces, ruins their financial numbers, or two, they cut back on their investments. And to me, that's where the problem arises. Because if I'm going to JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Block, you name them, and I say, you got to put in a billion bucks. And I go, you know what? I, 
I don't want to put in a billion dollars right now. I'm going to actually scale back my operations. That means I'm doing less spending. There's, to me, there's unintended consequences of these of these reports. Um, doesn't require, nope, doesn't require anything with the stakeholders or shareholders at all. Nope. So let me run through, hopefully up at this point, you guys, I know I'm not the best at presenting this, but you understand a little bit about what's coming, right? It's a much more regulatory um, risk management framework for financial institutions. On one hand, I'm happy with that. Um, I think that what we've experienced with this huge surge in our market since COVID hit is reckless lending, just flooding the markets with money to stimulate the economy. There is currently zero reserve requirement for banks, which there should be a reserve requirement, meaning a percentage of deposits should be held. That's not there right now. So the systemic risk, in my opinion, is pretty significant. It's, it's very spread out. That money is all out there. Now, if we get, let's see, um, Basel Community Banking Supervision. All right, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Thomasina. Or they could uh, send bank execs who, cheaty, who cheated to jail. That might scare them. Well, yeah, that'll never happen, Margaret. It'll never happen because those bank execs are, you know, basically in bed with the regulators. So good luck with that one. So let me just run through my unintended consequences here because, again, I think that this is great for you and me. I think that this is a good thing. I think banks need to be held accountable. I think that they should be be stronger, um, have a stronger footing. And I think these requirements will actually help maintain that stronger footing. And maybe it, it's not going to prevent banks from taking risks, but at least keep them more accountable. And, and the, the regulators will be looking at violations of these numbers much more closely. It gives the Fed something to focus on. So I think that's really important. Now my unintended consequences. Where is the money coming from this? All right, first one is constraining of the banking sector. Again, if these companies are forced to have higher standards and have more money uh, reserved for specific loans and things, they may not lend out as much. So think about it this way. Again, if, I, if I'm a bank and I lend to Merlin Rothfeld, I don't need to keep as much assets on hand because Merlin is not a credit risk. But if I go to uh, my, my friend Kevin, who has got horrible credit, the bank will now be required to classify his mortgage at a much higher rate because of loan to value and credit risk. So they'll have to hold more money for him. So what might happen here is people with bad credit scores or that don't put up enough money and have a high loan to value won't get loans. What does that mean? Well, that means that the housing market might slow down a little bit. I'm not saying it's going to crash. What I'm saying is one of the catalysts we've enjoyed in this huge surge of economic boom we've had for the past three years has been housing. People buying and buying and buying and flipping and investing. If all of a sudden Basel comes in and puts more handcuffs on banks and requires them to hold more money for one loan versus another, the bank's going to be a lot more selective and say, I'm not going to lend to this guy. It's just too much capital risk. We'll, we'll forget Kevin. We'll focus on the Merlins out there that may impact the housing market and lending market uh, in the future, right? Not right now, but I think it does kind of strangle the, the banks a little bit. It handcuffs them, if you will, with regards to what they can do with their money and, and I guess holds them more accountable for their actions, which on one hand is good, but remember, if you tighten them up too much, that means they're not lending out to businesses. They're not lending out for infrastructure projects. They're not lending out for new car loans, which leads to car sales. So the spending machine, starts to slow down because of Basel III. Are we safer for it? Yes, but the spending machine slows down and that could lead to some economic issues in 2025, 2026, and, and around then. Uh, let's see. Isn't this, isn't this how having them on the blockchain can help increase transparency? Certainly um, it would be, but we'll never have the, we'll never have the banks on a blockchain. I, I don't think banks will ever go to an open public source blockchain. They'll, they'll have what's called a, a um, consortium blockchain. So for those who want a quick one, there's three types of blockchains. You have a public open blockchain, which would be Bitcoin or Ethereum. You can see everything, totally transparent and open. You have a consortium or federated blockchain, which is where you have a small group of people have access to it. And that to me is what the banking sector will be. The Fed will probably have their own blockchain and it will include all the banks, but you and I can't see anything in that. It's behind their wall, but they can't. And then you have what's called a private blockchain, which is like the DMV, right? Only one group can see that and it has nothing to do with the public. So credit squeeze works both ways. Yep. And it does. And it does. 
Uh, let's see what else we got. So that's my first unintended consequence is constraining that banking sector. Number two is the capacity to support the real economy, meaning its ability to promote small businesses growth. Uh, I, I think this will probably be the biggest piece of this. So you're saying there has to be a gamble in order for there to be an upside. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure if I know that there has to be a gamble, but what I'm saying is if you take everything at, at face value, banks make money in a specific way. So their earnings could be somewhat predictable. You can kind of somewhat gauge what a bank is going to do based off economic, economic activity, lending rates, etc. The wild card comes in, like Bear Stearns and uh, Lehman Brothers, when they start doing big lending with over leverage and they're really pushing the boundaries too far. That shouldn't have happened. Under Basel, you wouldn't get to that 20% um, leverage rate that Lehman Brothers was caught, and I think Bear Stearns as well. Um, yeah, we haven't, we haven't implemented yet. We're, it's basically, it's been pushed through. Um, I know some senators are totally against it. Some are all for it. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it's actually been voted through yet, but it's in the process of. So the number two big unintended consequence is its impact the economy. And I think that's a monster one. I mean, banks are critical in growing an economy. Next one. Reducing the attractiveness of the banking sector. I can tell you what, that as soon as Basel goes in place, if, 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 if it goes in place in 2025, I will probably be going out there and going to XLF or the big $100 billion um, asset under, under management companies and shorting those. And it may actually happen sooner than when Basel gets implemented. But I just, I can't, I can't see a way that these banks can actually increase their earnings when all of a sudden you're getting much more regulatory pressure. The only way I see them doing it is taking on more trading risk, which is operational risk, which of course Basel will cover, right? And make sure they don't get too much risk. Or the other way is charging you a whole bunch of fees. And I don't know if charging that much fees is gonna offset the amount of potential lost revenue due to these constraints uh, on the banking sector. So something to keep an eye on for the next you know, year Right, I'll follow this one, let you guys know more about Basel um, as it gets through. But it was definitely brought up at a few of the recent Senate subcommittee meetings. I haven't watched I watched part of the testimony today. I'll watch the rest of it later on. It's terrible. The testimony today was so bad. All it was was well, Democrats this and my those Democrats are anti patriotic and they're ruining America and then oh the Republicans are ruining America. It's like God guys, just can you work together to make this place great again? Um, if a bank violates the requirement What's the punishment? Um, don't know. It will probably be some fine. And the irony is the bank didn't have the money to meet those requirements. So will they be able to pay the fine? I'm not sure what the punishments will be. Um, do they get shut down by the regulatory bodies? Maybe. I, I don't know. That's a good question, Les. And then finally, my last piece on here, increases banking costs. So obviously, this is going to be a burden, a capital burden for banks. And I think the fees will be certainly the first thing that goes up. My guess is free checking and those types of things will disappear. You'll see them, oh, it's going to be a couple bucks a month. Yeah, it's tough. It, it, it's a tricky one. I, on one hand, I do see them approving it because you, got it, you, you, you can't afford a systemic failure of our financial system. Right. So you're absolutely right, Pepe. It's a double edged sword. On one hand, I can see him saying no way to this. Right. Congress going no way because this is going to stunt economic growth in America. However, if we let banks continue to what, do what they do without accountability, which to me is a big one. I saw that come up here earlier from, I think, Margaret or Liz or Thomasina. If they're not held accountable for taking too much risk and failing, then these banks will continue to do so. So on one hand, I, we can't have a systemic failure in our economy. But you also don't want to cut off the, the funding spigot, which continues to push our economy forward. You're kind of caught in that conundrum, and I don't know which side I'm, I'm more on. Personally, I would rather see a more stable financial system that's not going to fail. Um, I, would, I, I think the fractional reserve banking is, is kind of a Ponzi scheme, and I think it should be reined in a little bit. I'm not saying it has to be one-to-one -one lending, but this infinite lending that banks can do based off of customer deposits to me is... Is almost fraudulent. I mean, it's it's crazy to think that no money is really sitting in our banks, but billions have been deposited, trillions have been deposited, and it's not there. That that's frightening. Uh, Rob L says Stephen Hooskin invested a lot of money in New York community bank shares today. The stock stopped trading almost ten times. Oh, I did not see that. Um, I'll check that here in just a second. 
So, you know, one other piece here, there was a, a comment, I think it was from Andres, talking about shadow banking. You know, one area this actually is interesting for is crypto, because it's outside the banking system. Um, and that, in, in a way, it is shadow banking. Now, not to the same extent that, let's say, a money market fund is a good example of shadow banking, where you can earn yield on your money, uh, but money market funds are not to the same type of regulatory lockdowns uh, that banks are. So maybe we get some other regulations there, but I, I think this actually does act as a, a, a tip of the cap to cryptocurrencies and digital assets because Bitcoin's a one-to-one, -one, right? When I have Bitcoin on my blockchain, on the blockchain, it's there, I own it. Whereas if you asked your bank, hey, I've got $50,000 in the bank, where is it? And they're going to say, oh, it's with the bank. Uh, no, it, it, God knows where it's at. It'd be someplace completely different. We have no idea. Oh, thanks, Thomasina. Thank you. And I need to get back to you regarding your email. I'm happy to help you. I'm not going to charge you, Thomasina. Just, just email me. Let me know what you want. Um, what else we got here? Set a phone call. Bank violates. I don't, yeah, I don't know what the... Damn speech to... Oh, you got speech to text. <laughs> uh, cool. Cool. I'm glad you guys enjoyed that one. Um, you know, who knows where it's going to go? But again, I want to thank you for sending that question. Was that John? Um, someone said the question in there it is something we're going to face here in the near future and it's going to be pretty important to the financial Scott Scott sent that question so Scott thank you very much for that question I hope I, I explain that a little bit it will benefit the it will benefit the banks from a stability perspective it will hurt the banks from a profit perspective and you look at those price charts of the banks recently and it's been been rather phenomenal so uh, especially like JP Morgan like I'll bring up JPM here Real quick, let me bring this up for you guys. And we'll go through our top 10. JPM. I mean, JP Morgan's chart's been absolutely incredible. This is just a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous looking chart, especially if you're long JP Morgan. I wish I had held mine from the time I wrote my article last year because it'd be a, a gigantic winner, but oh well, made my little bit of money. Um, anyway, that uh, that's my discussion on Basil. I hope you learned a little bit along the way. Hope you found that one informative. Let me dive into our, I got actually one other question here which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save to the end. I, it's, a, it's an interesting question, which I want to ask you guys. And I think it's going to be our topic for tomorrow's show. Um, but I don't want to give it to you yet because I don't want you to type them in the chat yet. So let's run through our top seven here. Obviously, the big story of the day was the, the complete about face, the roller coaster ride that is cryptocurrency and digital assets. Just phenomenal moves up for Bitcoin today. But I'm not going to start there. We're going to start with this 10-year. So here's the 10-year yield. You know, we're getting to that point where it's starting to get a little concerning for anybody who is bullish on yield. Of course, this sell-off here is good for the markets. This is good for the housing market. It's good for the broader economy if this 10-year yield continues to drop. However, what this does do is it, it continues to hurt the yield curve inversion, right? When the 10-year drops like this, it hurts that inversion. And I haven't looked at this chart in quite a while, but the 10 and the 1-year is what Bill Addis considers to be the true inversion of the yield curve, right? We are currently inverted to the tune of 85 basis points, 0.85. But look how long we have been inverted, right? That is a longest time in my lifetime that this yield curve has been inverted. Of course, I really didn't know much about the financial markets till the 80s, but uh, you're, you're looking at an incredibly long period where this inversion is going to continue to have its you know, impact on our economy. It was starting to look better. Here's the 10 and the 2, but they're both still just unbelievably inverted. Looks looks absolutely horrible. And that drop down today did not help at all. Or like drop down this week for that 10 year. Today you saw another nice little slide in that 10 year yield. Now let me continue on up here to the dollar index, which had its pullback. You know, we've got um, a level, it's coming into it, right? You get down to around this 120, uh, or sorry, 103 mark, right? That's kind of your next area of demand for this one. You look at the bigger picture, it's been chopping sideways. The short-term picture shows that it's been actually been showing a little bit of strength here from December of last year, but I, I, I didn't expect it to, to spike down like this. I thought we kind of slowly drift and move back up here. 13-week T-bill is, is still paying 5.5% roughly. you got to love that. Uh, just so you know, that 13-week is not 5.5% for 13 weeks. That's annualized for five year, <laughs> for 13 weeks. You do not, but Big Ab, you would not have, you'd be amazed at how many people have come up to me and said, hey, I can get 5.5% rate of return for 13 weeks? No, no. It's annualized. If you held those all year, you'd get 5.5% for the year. Just make sure everybody gets that one and understands. Because five and a half percent for the next thirteen weeks, I'm pretty sure most of us would. Lo I'd load the boat on it <laughs> for T bills. Are you kidding me? 
All right, let's move up our list here. We start to get to positive territory after yesterday's uh, sharp sell-off. We had a nice little pause here. The S&P came right down to that consolidation period we had just a week ago, so really not that much of a sell-off. Sold off and then rallied up today 0.51%, closing at 5,111. So all in all, looking great for the S&P. You look at the NASDAQ. A nice about face here, although there are some pieces that were continuing to sell off on that NASDAQ. I'll look at those individually. NASDAQ was up 0.64% on the day, 18,044, but still nothing to worry about. Look at that picture. There's nothing on this picture that says freak out now. It just says uptrend, slowing a little bit, but still a nice uptrend. Gold, I love it. Oh man, we got that break out of that channel and it is just going. I kind of mentioned this, uh, you know, seeking an all time high and continue going. Uh, I did today sell calls against all of my remaining silver, just so you guys know. Um, I sold the $23 strikes. This is a little off topic, but since I've been telling you about the silver I'm in, may as well show you it. Um, I sold we, on what day was this? On Monday, I sold calls against my. Uh, a one position, 4,000 shares worth of it at 22.50. And then I sold the rest of them today at 23. So let me move this line down here to 23 so I can see what my numbers are. And I sold the uh, March 15th. So, you know, nine days away. Uh, it was it was basically, I think, 0.8% was the rate of return on that one. Great. I'll give myself an extra 0.8%. I don't think we'll get to 23 by next Friday, but if we do, it is what it is. Um, Aw, oh, freak out. It is a great song. It is a good song there, Margaret. Pepe says indexes look weak. Well, I don't know if they look weak. They're just slowing down. They're still moving up, right? Did they, they look weaker now than they did back here in these huge accelerated moves from November? Yeah, sure. But the trend is still up. Until we start making new lows, the trend is going to keep on going up. So anyway, that's the silver update there, Big Eb. I know you're, you keep asking about the silver, so that's, that's the update on that. So all my silver now has calls against it some at 2250 some at 23 uh top podium time russell 2000 20 69 looking great you had that shooting star uh, on monday's trading activity as it tipped into those highs right there we still have an ascending triangle going on russell 2000 although today rallying back up trying to get back up to that uh, top line there right around 20 2079 we had a 0.70 percent increase for the russell all in all i still like it it feels like the Russell's building pressure and wants to break to the upside. Okay, now, my most important security for the year, or my most important investment item for the year, crude oil. You have 1.25% move up today. It still did not break above those levels that we've identified as kind of being that critical, which is this 80.82 mark. Uh, we tiptoed into it today. The high on our crude oil futures was 80.67. So very close to it. Gave back some of those gains, but still I'm okay. It feels like crude oil building pressure getting stronger to the upside. So keep around that 80.82 mark. Once it breaks that, I think you're going to have some big pops to the upside. And finally, the big daddy, Bitcoin, up 8.5% today. Giant uh, Christmas sandwich candlestick formation i don't know i just made that one up you got uh two green patties with a or two green buns with a giant red <laughs> candle in the middle of it it's the uh the christmas patty candle formation i guess but you know love it you know all that pain and panic and people freaking out yesterday with regards to bitcoin this is the end i, I love the quick about face i was like i don't think it's going to go down much further that was just a knee-jerk reaction now it to me it's all about accumulation you know you look at I think, if I'm not mistaken, Bitcoin is, uh, the Bitcoin ETF has eclipsed the silver ETF and amount of money pouring into it. Pretty impressive there. It has had billions and billions of dollars pouring into it. And if that continues, which I think it will, uh, this thing's going to continue to go higher. So there we go. And that is your uh, top run through of our markets. Now let's go to our economic calendar here. I have it all. It's kind of all messed up. Let me just fix this real quick. So obviously you have the Fed child, Fed, Fed chair. Fed Powell chair testimony. That was a tough one. Couldn't get those words out. Uh, during his testimony today, you know, it was a lot about Baz, a lot about the economy, and they kept growing them about inflation. If it's not, an, it, it was just ridiculous. I hated how they would just point at one uh, elected official and say, well, this is, it's their fault for this. No, it's not. You know, the reason that we, we put ourselves in this inflationary environment is the colossal printing of money, which is approved upon by the Republicans. It was approved upon by the Democrats. It was approved upon by the Treasury Department. It was approved upon by the Federal Reserve. You don't point at one finger at any one party. This is collective government inflation creation. There's not one person did this. Anyway, um, here's your news for today. So there was a rate announcement, which we saw from Canada 
really nothing changed. They came out at 5%. For the U.S., the pieces that were impactful was this ADP non-farm employment change. Now, it was a disappointment. They expected it to go from 111,000 to 149,000. It only came out at 140. So slightly short uh, of expectations, but all in all, not bad. And when you look at the big picture here, let me go past that gigantic COVID sell-off. You know, we're, we're basing, you know, just kind of sideways, slight growth here on ADP non-farm employment change. But remember, jobs don't matter right now. There's, there's plenty of jobs. Uh, unemployment numbers at historic level, so not that big of a deal. I did notice that wholesale inventories were declining worse than expected, which is okay. Um, it's not horribly bad, but it is, again, a negative number, which obviously we want to see fewer negative numbers. Wholesale has not looked good since 2023. It's just been kind of a uh, wholesale inventories anyway. And then let's go into what we have cooking for tomorrow so I can wrap this show up and not do another hour show as you guys love to drag me into. Um, for Thursday, we start to get some really good economic announcements. Number one, 5.15 a.m., you're going to have the main refinance rate for the ECB. Right now, that's expected to stay at 4.5%. We jump to the U.S., well, you've got unemployment claims numbers coming out. You have challenger job cuts. You have uh, non-farm productivity, labor costs, trade balance. And then you have the second day of testimony from Jerome Powell. That is going to be in front of the Senate Banking Subcommittee. So that will be probably the same round of grilling from just different representatives. So big deal there. Uh, and then you also have natural gas storage. Um, earnings front, let me bring up your earnings calendar. I don't have that one all prepped and ready to go for you as I usually like to have it all set and ready to go. But we'll get that one for you right now. There were a couple uh, earnings names out there today in the retail space that uh, we thought we'd talk about. That's going to be, you had Abercrombie & Fitch report, you had JD.com, uh, Foot Locker, which missed badly. Uh, well, they, they beat earnings, but their forecast was absolutely atrocious, down 29%. That's one I will not be selling puts again and trying to capitalize on that panic. For tomorrow's March 7th announcements, you've got Broadcom, Costco, all eyes on the big daddy there. Costco, you got Marvell Technology, you got Kroger's, Burlington's, uh, Petrolio Brasileiro, and that's pretty much it for your earnings calendar. Now, I see I've got questions here asking from Arab. Says, thoughts on Palantir? P L T R. Let's check that bad boy out. Been all over the place. You know, I, I mentioned this in the past. I have a hard time myself chasing this. And, you know, I wrote an article on this back in March of 2023. Back here, uh, we, I wrote an article where we're talking about. AI stocks and, and why AI is kind of embracing the future and looking at things like NVIDIA, looking at things like uh, uh, Intuitive Surgical and Palantir and there's a few others. Um, you know, I, I did not build a position in these AI stocks. I, I saw it, but I just didn't, didn't capitalize on it. I guess I was a bit skeptical and, and decided to jump on it. As far as buying into Palantir right now, Rob, I, I would feel skeptical on it. You're really going to, you know, Right at the high, you know, one of the main mistakes you're not supposed to make is buy after a big rally in price. Well, you've had a big rally in price. And as Pepe says, you've got a bull flag formation. Yeah, it's not the best uh, bull flag formation, but you can kind of see that it went sideways for a bit, almost as a wedge formation from those lows. I mean, it does look strong, but you, if I was to buy this, you'd have to have a tight stop loss on it because it. I don't like buying things that have moved up that much. It always just kind of freaks me out when things um, run that quickly. Palantir got that new AI deal. Yeah, but remember, Oliver, here's my issue with the markets right now. Everybody's going to say they're getting an AI deal. Everyone's going to say they're getting, they're doing something with NVIDIA. What was the one that you wanted the other day, guys? It was a, AUD something, audio, what was that, AU, I forget that ticker symbol. What was the audio one you guys were like, oh, I got a deal with NVIDIA, um, AU, AUDO, I can't remember the top of my head. Yeah, um, I, I'm not touching anything like that unless it's at a at a low. Uh, I'm not buying things on breakouts or moves to the upside. Let's go. This is that one you guys just mentioned earlier. That New York Community Bank Corp said Manuchkins. Was it Sound? I think that was Sound. S O H U. I think might have been it. Les. I'll type that in just a sec. Um, again, I'm not touching this one either. New York Community Bank Corp. Um, he said Manuchkin was buying a bunch. Good for him. I'm not. I just not touching it. I got burned on First Republic, so I done. Sound have. There you go. Thank you, Liz. S S O U N. No, this is another one that 
has gotten an AI deal and oh it's working with Nvidia and all of a sudden it had a huge surge up from a buck forty dollars up to you know eight bucks and now drifting lower. Not saying it's gonna crash all the way back down to one, but you wait for these pullback levels. And I drew out a demand zone here where it's like, okay, if it gets to four bucks and I might be interested in this one, of course I don't really like to buy penny stocks. It's not not my thing. Um, but if it's yours, if it is yours, just make sure you got stop losses in place. Right? It's it's more speculative and gambling than I like to do, which you know for some people that's fine. But I've I've paid my dues there. I'm not not interested in, in the gamble side of things. I'll do some speculative, but uh, I'm not gonna not take the flyers like that anymore. Okay, I think I got it covered, and I'm out of here in 45 minutes. Love it. Um, here is the last part for today. Let me get this picture up here because someone asked this question. And I thought it was a good one, and I want to I'm gonna let let tomorrow's show be more community piece. Uh, by the way, just so you know, I'm going to have John O'Donnell on on Monday. He said he's going to be the guest. Um, here's what I, I, I think we'll do for tomorrow. You can send him in tonight if you want. Although, if you send him in earlier, I can do more research. Although, I have a lot of stuff I need to take care of. Maybe just keep them for tomorrow's chat. Like, just do a little bit of research tonight and share your thoughts. And I'll go through them one by one and I'll share mine. But here's the question that I got and I thought uh, I'll share it. James says, what's the wildest thing that you've seen in the markets, right? What's something that you just, you've seen and you just go, what in the hell? Like, oh my God, like this is crazy, right? What are the things that you look at and you go, wow, this chart or this picture is just the best thing I've seen or the worst thing I've seen. So that's your homework for tonight. I will share at least something in the last, I'll say the last uh, six months, it's probably the most amazing chart I've seen in, in a long time. It's really unbelievable, and to me, it just doesn't make any sense. But I will bring that one up on tomorrow's show because James asked, what's the wildest thing you've seen in this markets? When you say these in the markets, I'm just going to assume recent, right? I could go back through time and show you guys some just ridiculous stuff. I could even remember what the ticker symbols were. Uh, but I do have one in mind. Uh, no, not yet. No, not to Craig Weil. Uh, John, yeah, John, that'll be good. John, will be good. So, on tomorrow's show, you can either email me at tradermarone at gmail.com, put it down below any of the YouTube videos and say, this is the wildest thing I, I've seen recently, type it in, or just keep it ready for tomorrow's show, and we'll start off with that for tomorrow's wild Thursday show. So, thank you guys so much. Hope you had some fun and learned something about Basil today. Uh, again, nothing to freak out about. It's just something that's going to be impacting us in the near future. Next year, it'll really start to be much more of a bigger topic, but at least now you're armed with some more discussion and knowledge about what it is, what it represents, and the impact for you and the markets. Take care, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow.